the eureka moment do you remember the specific moment was it a person was it a conversation was it a statistic what was it that inspired you to now spend your whole life really dedicated to these causes it's, it's a group of workers um, who were on strike then uh, they had this picket line in in front of the gate of where their you know um, their workplace the the factory they were paper mill workers and i distinctly remember it and then they went into strike because of um they were bargaining for higher wages and working conditions better working conditions the next time we went there was like i was so surprised because uh that morning um the the trade union president was killed, Tarufo. I really remember his name, Tarufo. So I was shocked. Christina Tenai Balabai is a relentless champion for human rights and the Secretary General of Garapatan Alliance Philippines. She's been elected to this critical role since 2012, steering the advocacy for human rights across the nation. Back in her university days at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Tanai was already a spirited activist, leading a major alliance of student governments. Later, she co-founded and became the Secretary General of the Gabriela Women's Party, a rarity in women's political representation. Beyond Philippine shores, Tanai's influence spans globally. She's been a driving force in campaigns against torture, enforced disappearances, and seeking justice for martial law victims. Tanai Palabai also holds a significant role as a regional council member of the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, working tirelessly for women's rights across the Asia Pacific region. Welcome to the latest episode of the School of Social Justice video podcast. I'm really glad to be joined by Christina here in her headquarters in um, Manila, Philippines. And we just had a very interesting chat about her background and what she's been up to. But first off, it would be great, Christina, to um, hear about yourself and kind of uh, a bit about your work. Uh, tell us what you do. Well, I think uh, since I was um, a student in the university, like 16 years old, I'm 43, by the way, okay. um, I've been uh, a social activist. Uh, I think it's it's one of those eureka moments that that you know you you you, you venture into um, some sort of uh, independence from your your parents. You go to the university and then you see uh, the real world. No, the real mm. world meaning it's it's not a pampered lifestyle. No, we're from the middle class. Um, from we're from a middle class family. My father was. Um, a Navy officer during martial law, Marcus's martial law, and he worked in the presidential yacht. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so, so it, it was a middle class, um, uh, what's call it, uh, lifestyle. But when I got to UP, it's, University uh, of Philippines. Uh, University of Philippines. University of the Philippines here in Quezon City. It's like a different word, different meaning. You see the communities, the urban poor communities within UP, within the campus itself. You get to meet people uh, from different backgrounds. I went to um, uh, some trade unions okay. you know, uh, nearby. So it's like when you when you get those um, when you see those things, when you talk to people, uh, you get that eureka thing. You know, that. Um, I think this is one of what I want to do in okay. my life. I can't unsee things. You know? So since then, I've um, you know I've, I've uh, been uh, a student activist. Um, we co-founded. I was one of the co-founders of a women's political party, a progressive one. Um, and then uh, in uh, twenty in twenty ten, I just said, okay. Um, working in the spaces of parliament seems like, you know, kind of stifling for me. Really? So I, wa I, I went into human rights work with Karapatan. Amazing, and that's what brings us here today. I mean, uh, for context, um, so 
I've been introduced to Christina by actually one of my mentors, Suzanne Cueva. So Suzanne, we both know, uh, Susan being very active in the United Kingdom on human rights issues and raising awareness amongst Filipinos but other people um, in, in Europe about what's happening here in the Philippines. And like you, she, you know, she influenced me a lot in terms of being a trade unionist. I was at the university when we first met. And she kind of, I remember going into, you know, Freshers Week, I don't know if you have it here, like the first two mm, weeks yes. of university. And I saw like a student society and it said campaign for human rights in the Philippines. And I was like, I've never even considered human rights issues there. And when I heard about the enforced disappearances, the, the killings, the removals of political opponents, teachers, journalists, it was really shocking and like you I think it was there was a eureka moment in the sense of as you said how can I ignore this I can't and, and let's do something about it so I'd love to actually talk about that a bit more so when you were young at that time we're still young at heart um the eureka moment do you remember the specific moment was it a person was it a conversation was it a statistic what was it that inspired you to now spend your whole life really dedicated to these causes? I think it's a, it's, quite, it's, it's, it's a group of workers um, who were on strike then. Uh, they had this picket line in, in front of the gate of where their, you know, um, their workplace, the, the factory. They were paper mill workers. And I distinctly remember it. And then they went into strike because of... Um, they were bargaining for higher wages and working conditions, better working conditions. And then um, I've been going there for like every weekend for three weeks. And then um, the next time I was so surprised. The next time we went there was like, I was so surprised because uh, that morning um, the, the trade union president was killed. Barufo. I really remember his name, Karufo. So I was shocked you know, because I saw how they were so organized. You know? The workers were so organized, even in the picket lines. They had this, um, this they had these discussions. Uh, they had this, you know, uh, kitchen. Mm -hmm. This whole battalion of of trade unionists. And then what they what they're asking for is not even, you know, um, a lot of money. It's just pitans actually for the lives of their families. But when Karufo was killed that morning, it really shocked me to the point that I said, how can these bad things happen to good people? And I immediately um, said that, you know, I cannot just accept things the way things are right now. They were like then. So, um, I think what inspired me, well, perhaps it's because there was violence, no? but at the same time, I really felt that uh, trade unionists no? um, are among the poor members of our communities who have been the most neglected ones since time immemorial. And we cannot move forward as a country if your worker, the backbone of your economy, is you know being treated like this yeah i mean that's really powerful and just i mean i felt it i'm smiling now to try and hide the, the fact that i was uh, you know, three weeks knowing you met this person you're there and suddenly they were gone um i think that was definitely one of the hardest things kind of trying to be a human rights activist seeing the faces of people but then there's a point where you just see so many faces that you kind of forget Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about real people with real families um, with real lives who have been removed from, from this existence. I mean, I kind of want to get into that now. So, mm -hmm. modern day Philippines, mm -hmm. um, what's the human, the human rights situation right now in the Philippines? Mm -hmm. From the UK's perspective, when I've been there watching it, there was a very particular kind of view of what was happening under Duterte's um, administration. Mm -hmm. um, as a human rights person, I was shocked, but also not so shocked and also angry, and yet a lot of my family members in the Philippines, uh, on some sides, were strong supporters. And, and so for me, it was always confusing being, well, I'm a British-born Filipino, who am I to judge? But also I know that 
there's a lot of things going on wrong here. That was previous government, we've got a new government. Tell us a bit about modern day um, kind of human rights issues and kind of what's different. I can't say any difference. Oh, really? <laughs> I can't it's feel any difference because you know, I, I mean, the, the the kind of um, violence brought by the state forces the past years, you know, they are all in numbers. You know? There's even a debate: the number of deaths in the drug war from thirty thousand versus seven thousand. I mean, it's it's always it's always like that you know sometimes in human rights work of course we do documentation we also, we also speak about facts and statistics you know? but there's a uh, some sort of um the humanizing thing about that kind of narrative you know? because people people do, should not just be treated like numbers right for me it's it's about it's about my friends many of my friends People that I've worked with, good people, um, have been killed in the past years. Many. Fifteen of our human rights workers were killed. I saw documenters, very brave uh, paralegal workers. Um, they work in communities, etc. But, um, but they were not looked at kindly. They were seen as threats. Apparently, that's why their voices were silenced. So, so, for me, um, that kind of environment, uh, the environment that, how can I describe it? The, the environment that um, that people are afraid to speak out and um, exercise their ba most basic of rights. You know, I think that's that's annoying. That's the kind of environment that that. That says a no authoritarian <laughs> yeah. on its face. Yeah. I mean, in communities, there may be varied um, um, views. No? But one thing is, I think, is quite clear. When you ask people, do you think the rule of law or justice exists in the Philippines? Have people been given justice for the numerous, numerous people here? What name can they say? And the Los Santos, but that's one of one name out of the thousands who were violated in here. So I think it's that state of the state of unpeace. The state of unpeace is there, it remains. So that is the reason why I said that there's no essential difference. I mean, that's really important to remember because I think in any major uh, issue that faces society, whether it be we were talking previously about economic difficulties, cost of living, in this case human rights issues, there will always be a need to hold whoever's in power to account. Um, and I think that's one of the things which I always admire with people like Susan, people like yourself, because you know, where you know, you've dedicated your life to this cause. Um, and, you know, you were joking earlier about the late hours at which you work and you know, how difficult it is sometimes just practically and logistically. It, as a lifestyle, it's very hard. But, there are a lot of people out there who might be starting their journey um, where they're trying to figure out, you know, what is it I want to dedicate my life to? And you just mentioned 15 of your colleagues who have been you know, killed during this work. Even knowing that, why do you continue in this work, given the very clear threat of losing, potentially losing your life? I think I've met too many brave people. Mm. People who have experienced the worst, but um, they persist. They hope. They believe that you know, society can be better, we can be better. So if, if, if we're talking about my view about it, it's like, um, I don't know if that's the Filipino thing about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, how can I, how can I give up? No. If these people who had it worst no, are not giving up, no, and and they have become human rights defenders themselves, no, uh, they uh, continue. They continue to work. No. I've seen. I've worked with uh, martial law survivors. 
I've worked with the mothers of uh, the victims of enforced disappearances. I've worked with the, victim, uh, the families of those victims uh, of extrajudicial killings. How can I not continue if their um, journey is about hope? So, so I think uh, that's where I get what I mean. It may sound so abstract, but for me, it's it's really how I I wake up every every day uh, and uh, you know see what lies ahead in my day. <laughs> what should I do? How can I make things better? Um, even in my own way. So I think that goes for anyone else. You know? We 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 want to. Um, I think inherently we want to make things better for ourselves and, and for our families. But um, but there's a, a a whole structure, a whole system you know, that unmakes uh, families and makes you know. Um, our realization of, of rights. So, um, I think it's 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 revolutionary to um, look at oneself as uh, or the cause that you you know adapt you know, uh, as something bigger than any of us. Well, that's it. I mean, you've gone as in the short space of time described your your journey from growing up in a middle class family, going to university seeing people from different backgrounds, getting an education from not only your former education but also mm -hmm. the trade unionists there, to then creating a, one of the world's only women's uh, political parties and now spending time a lot traveling trying to convince and lobby uh, people in Geneva, Brussels to, to really hold human rights problems to account for people responding mm -hmm. to that. Um, kind of, do you have any? Because one of the things that people wonder is that like, how do you do this, right? Like the actual methods of change. You've mentioned um, monitoring. You've mentioned documentation. You've mentioned actually being on a protest and picket line. Can you tell us a bit more about your methods for change? How do you do what you do? And um, do you have any examples? I think um, one basic thing that. Um, I, I learned is that uh, you, know, you, you cannot you alone cannot unmake things you know? so you have we have to think in a collective way each and every time each and every time meaning um, the programs that we have for example um, with our human rights organizations uh, our human rights organization documentation of uh, uh, human rights violations. We go into fact-finding missions. We conduct okay. key informant interviews. Can you tell us a bit um, about the fact-finding mission? Like, if somebody would like to do a fact-finding mission, what what's the starting point there? I think it, it depends on um, if the community uh, um, asks for it, because it's needs based. Okay. So, if if they are if they want if they need to document. You know, Whatever happened in the community or whatever happened to an individual, it's it's their choice. You know? So consent is there, it should be there. Uh, so there's a human rights issue, say for example, somebody might have been uh, killed or kidnapped or, and then you will go in to speak with a family or the co-workers. Or they contact us. Or the contact. Okay, so mm -hmm. you've got a lot of inbound. And then you, it's almost like casework. Each case you have yes. to figure out how to deal with it. Okay. Uh, basically. Okay. So, uh, so there's lots of cases, <laughs> but uh, be because we have uh, an, uh, an organization, yeah. you know, so that makes things, um, that lays things in a more stru structured manner. So, for example, you have 16 offices out of the 17 uh, in, in out of the 17 administrative regions in the country. Okay. Uh, we have uh, more than a hundred uh, full-time human rights workers. Uh, of course, there are volunteers and part-time human rights workers. Um, and uh, we have uh, a network of more than 40 member organizations of Tarapatan. But I think the basic thing that, that um, my predecessors in the organization have taught me is that um, you're part of a movement. Mm. They're part of a social movement, so um, you do not choose. You need to be part of 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 uh, 
um, the, the most the, the basic sectors who know it most you know, their situations how they can remedy uh, their situation so we we have that we have that framework when we do our work documentation or if we provide direct services you know, for example um, uh, sanctuary uh, for battled human rights defenders or uh, um, we provide medical support for human rights defenders or communities in need for livelihood support, for example, okay. for for um, displaced communities, that sort of stuff, or paralegal support. So it, this really reminds me, I used to work in a church in London mm -hmm. um, as a social outreach coordinator. And a lot of the times I was working with homeless folk who'd come to the church for food and clothes, but also we'd get people from the parish and the local community, which is one of the poorest in London, coming to support when it came to welfare or helping, even with just writing a form because of literacy rates yeah. and being poor. Um, my understanding now is that this is a very grassroots organization with people on the ground who are people directly. And I wish I had more time to actually go out and to see your work um, on, on the ground, but maybe for a future kind of conversation. Um, do you have an example of a person you've helped or Karapatan and supported uh, recently to get give people a sense more of what actually happens with if a person comes to, to you? Um, do you have a, a case study or example you could share? Actually, we don't have many case studies um, because even if we, um, the, um, people in civil society would often consider uh, human rights people <laughs> or persons as the gloom and doom, unfortunately. Gloom and doom. <laughs> Why do you people? Say that? Well, because of course we talk about so dire so things, so right? Yeah, yeah. We talk about killings, we talk about violations, really gloom and doom. But the, the other side of it is that we do have victories. You know? mm. We do celebrate mm. milestones. Milestones such as, um, for example, if, if people who have been unjustly detained have been released, you know, there would be a party here. Oh, nice. Of Pansit. Pansit, uh, <laughs> Lumpia. <laughs> maybe so, Halo, maybe. Yeah, so, so, I mean, I think in the past two years, uh, we have been able to help out uh, 20 at least 20 uh, people who have been unjustly detained because of their political beliefs. It's not easy in the Philippines. No? I mean, you, 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 the median for people, for political prisoners, for example, median number of years that they get that they, that they stay in jail because of this um, made up charges is five years. Imagine five years. And then you, the cases, because of the strong um, legal defense, the campaigns that we do, um, they get released after five years. But it's still five years of their lives, right? Um, but this um, past two years, they were more um, easier releases because I think the, the public opinion is also with us yeah. and with the victims. So um, there have been many people who have been released, the um, uh, journalist who was arrested on uh, December 10th, okay. um, uh, two of her colleagues who were trade unionists, uh, the uh, women's rights activist um, Cora Agobida and then her husband uh, who's, a who's an urban poor organizer were also arrested in the dead of the night. Mm. Um, they were eventually released because of a positive decision by the court. So, so it's uh, for us. It's it's. We feel that those victories are, you know, uh, there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, each case not only represents freedom for that one person, but also the word you used earlier, hope for others who may still be in those positions. And that enables them to continue doing their work. Mm -hmm. So. So I, I think that's that's one milestone. But the other is also I think there's uh, um, the the work of uh, organizing mm. mothers or relatives of the disappeared, for example. Mm. For me, it's it's inspiring because when you see them um, lead their own organization, uh, conduct their own activities. 
that for me is empowering, that for me is a victory. Because, I mean, people are not subdued by injustice. And they, you know, they, they themselves claim their power uh, as human rights defenders. That's really powerful. Um, I can see your phone bling. I know you're a very busy person and we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, for the last bit, I'd love to know a bit more about yourself and your journey, particularly on the development of your craft. Now, we at the school really try to figure out what it takes as individuals, knowing the need for collective and organized responses. For people who just want to know how they can be a better advocacy campaigner, you know, you started, as you said, at university. You kind of earn your stripes in student activism um, and then learning in parliamentary politics and then international uh, human rights work. Could you share a bit more about what that journey was? Who did you learn from? How did you learn? You know, do you read a lot of books? What's your research methods? Mm -hmm. Do you shadow your heroes? Do you watch documentaries? Mm -hmm. um, do you do all of that? Like, what are your means through which you've been able to develop your own craft mm -hmm. to allow you to now lead um, this organization and mm -hmm. inspire others? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a combination of um, learning from the books. So you 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 you, you get um, you get your stud formal education in the universities, right? Uh, you learn from great professors. Of course, the University of the Philippines has many good, great professors, progressive ones, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people who have, you know, been through martial law, so they get to, um, you really hear it firsthand from them. My, my major is uh, Philippine literature, and uh, Southeast, my minor is Southeast Asian history. So, uh, from many, many of them, I, uh, are my prof professors and, of course, fellow students have been very helpful. But I think um, the thing that makes me uh, realize uh, the hard way <laughs> is really the hard way, the, the, the classroom outside the classrooms. So it's really in the communities. Okay. So my learning process is like... Um, uh, I, I do not, I mean, learned people are learned people. We have access to resources. Yeah. We have access to books, we have access, especially right now, we have access to information. But uh, there are, I really believe in what they said about organic intellectuals. The organic masses, intellectuals, what's that? The masses are organic intellectuals. People from uh, the four sectors of the society are organic intellectuals meaning they learn it from their own experiences. It's not just about being street smart. It's mm -hmm. about really learning uh, uh, their crafts and, you know, um, uh, building their knowledge from, from their own experiences. So I'm amazed by those people. Yeah. You know? yeah. Farmer leaders, trade union leaders, urban poor leaders. They don't have any degrees, right? Mm -hmm. they, don't, they didn't. They didn't even finish elementary, for God's sake. But they have uh, the knowledge that can even cha that can challenge the smartest president or uh, legislator because they they have it in their fingers. Eh? How many um, uh, hectares of agricultural land needs to be uh, uh, um, needs to be uh, farmed with and how much subsidy does farmers need? need you know, yeah, I don't know. But to do that, know, yeah. right? and, and how do they modernize our, uh, no, our, our, how can we modernize our agricultural sector you know, if if we're still in the uh, carabao, <laughs> if we still use carabaos in, in, uh, no, in plowing our lands, but, the, but many um, farming communities have developed their own technologies and ways of doing things to improve uh, agricultural production. So what I'm saying is that my journey, while uh, of course the, the deep personal um, ways that I do it, it's, it's of course I distress, of course uh, I'm a human person. Yeah, yeah. I love, I, I know, I, I, I cry, 
I'm you know amazed by small things. I'm amazed with that. I watch Netflix or HBO or whatever. Yeah. I read books. I have a big collection of books because I've got I've, 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 I'm, I'm I'm a literature. Uh, I majored in literature, but I think um, what makes it fulfilling for me is really my interaction with these organic intellectuals. I learn so much from them, and I can get those in the books. Mm. However, way I can't even get them on the internet. <laughs> yeah, some things that can't be captured by the digital. I mean, that's such a very interesting kind of name organic intellectuals and I think that's definitely something that the students will learn. Um, we're running out of time. Last question. Do you have anything you'd like to share um, which we haven't already shared or discussed with people who are aspiring to make a difference? They might not know necessarily how or with what organization or what this mm -hmm. means. Um, for people starting their journey or even wanting to make a career change, um, someone might have been kind of enthralled by something they've seen in the news and said, I want to do something about it. They might have met someone who inspired them. They might have um, been hurt personally by something that just happened in their life. And about, like, what, is there anything you want to leave with them to say to them, a quote you'd like to share, a book you'd like to share, something you want to share with the people who want to be the next generation of change makers? Uh, I think it's, it's 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 really, uh, re reality bites us in different ways. Bites us into um, submission on, you know, uh, to whatever the status quo wants. But uh, I think our history as, as, as the humankind you know, is replete with so many examples on how to transform. Yes. Clearly, we need to transform things from small to big things in, in, in our lives. So, um, I think there's reason to hope. There's, there are numerous reasons to hope from our own families, from our own selves, to the bigger community that we're part of. So, so I think it's, it's, it's there. It's, reality is just there. Yeah. No? Um, we should what is incumbent upon us is you know to take um to take uh, any sort of action towards that goal no matter how little or large but just starting thank you so much for your time that was a, a wonderful conversation and i think full of wisdom um i can really look forward to sharing that with everyone and uh Hopefully I can come back because I feel like it would be great to bring people here to kind of learn a bit more uh, so that they can get a real sense of, uh, of your work, your contributions. And so, but first of all, thank you so much. And secondly, uh, forward to continuing this journey with you and best of luck on your travels. Um, thank you. This educational content is absolutely free. Why? Because our vision is a world where anybody, no matter their background, can learn how to make a difference. To keep going, we need your help. Can you become our next patron? Can you help us reach 2,500 patrons? I really hope so. Whatever the case, hope you learned something today and sending you peace and love. Let's keep learning.